Coming up on Techzilla Speed Round, we're going to end shutter lag, give some Hulu Plus help, and wipe your PC. The perils of NAS, speeding up your router, our favorite audio compression options. We're talking about a box full of your viewer questions. So pop the cap off that bottle and pack yourself in the comfy chair, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by The Ben Heck Show, building, modding, and electronics culture with Ben Heck and friends. Brought to you by Element 14. Belkin, unleash your network. And Go to Assist Express, support smarter with Go to Assist Express. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to Techzilla, hands on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or what the best remedy is for a persistent cough, <coughs> we've got the answer for you. And if we don't, we'll track down someone who does. I should point out, Veronica has not butched up with steroids in a buzz cut. She's oh. on vacay this week, so Robert <laughs> Heron's joined me from, well, HD Nation. Hopefully you've seen it for the shoot today. Oh, yes. Yeah. Hey, the long-awaited boxy box hits the streets, or at least Amazon.com this week. Hey, we'll have a review of that on the next episode of HD Nation. Unfortunately, we couldn't get a box in-house in time for a full review today. We do have video of the interface, and we're stupid excited that Voodoo's gorgeous 1080p video streaming service with Dolby Digital Plus 5.1 surround will be out on the Boxy Box. Now, Voodoo is also showing up on the PC and Mac Boxy clients for your home theater PC enthusiasts out there. And unlike Apple TV, it supports 1080p, as do the latest Roku Boxing, my and my beloved TiVo. If you're not into spending anywhere from $99 to $300 for your set-top box to stream video content to your HDTV, you can always buy an HDTV with internet connectivity and video playback built in. That's going to be like a checkbox feature by this time next year. I can't wait. Internet-connected TVs make life good <laughs> for, for service and just for the added stuff you can do online. That's one of the rumors that Boxy is actually trying to be, you know, Plex I think is going into, I want to say LG televisions, and Boxy is actually trying to do something similar where they are sort of the, the interface going inside of televisions and making them more happy for print connecting to the internet. Yeah. We're, we're essentially ending up with the power of the latest generation of smartphones mm -hmm. and their capabilities, minus the cell stuff, <laughs> in the TV. So you're going to see a lot of crossover in app development between what you get in your the modern day smartphone and what you'll see in your television, yeah. just in a bigger screen and, of course, a different interface style, too. It's good stuff. Yeah. Free Wi-Fi, Google Chrome. Well, Google's Chrome is giving away free holiday Wi-Fi again this year. At least you're at 30,000 feet and flying AirTran, Delta, or Virgin America. If you are, you'll get free GoGo in-flight Wi-Fi on every domestic flight from November 20th to January 2nd, 2011. You can find out more at freeholidaywifi.com. The only downside is this means everybody on the plane. So even the cheap people will be using the Wi-Fi on the holiday flights now. <laughs> do, do people Skype when they're flying? People do everything when they fly. That can get a little annoying, but I wear earplugs nowadays. So when I'm in the air, so eh. dude, you were singing in the seat behind me on the last flight we took. We I were one of that. maybe we we're on one of those rare flights where we had maybe ten people in the whole plane. So we had the. That's why I was singing. You sat behind me and sang <laughs> pink songs. <laughs> Really? Is that what? Yeah. I'll just say it was post BlueCon. <laughs> hey, from the e-reader department, color e-ink books are on the way. Yay! E-ink powers most of the e-books worth owning, like Sony's e-reader and Veronica's beloved Kindle. But it's Hanvon that's promising to release the first color e-ink device, Ooh. says the New York Times. Why do you care? Battery life measured in weeks, not hours, like you have on the iPad and various LED-based notebooks. Yeah. The downside, says the New York Times, is reduced brightness and muted colors. According to the article, Sony and Amazon are waiting for more vibrant colors before making their own color e-books. Apparently, that's like the next big step for e-books is color. I, I already like the readability of the grayscale e-books. Yeah. So if they can do color and maintain that kind of paper-like display, I'm on it. <laughs> He's all over giving up <laughs> magazines. Toshiba Blade X Gale SSD. Those basically are the drives used inside the MacBook Air. All I'm saying is bring on the 256 gigabyte upgrades like PhotoFast. It's a company we talked about last week, a uh, Taiwanese company. No ship date for the Toshiba drives. But basically, it looks like it's going to be a, a, a semi-standard, not Apple proprietary format for those. And if you're looking for help deciding if you need the 4 gigabyte version of the MacBook Air with the 200 hertz faster CPU upgrade, check out an Ann's write-up at an Antec 
Logitech.com. Apple's 11-inch upgraded MacBook Air to 1.6 gigahertz and 4 gigabytes make a difference. Mm. I want to know. Is it over? Like, he, and Ann's rule of thumb, it's a good rule of thumb, is like if benchmarks have to be 10% or more for you to actually feel a, like an actual perceived difference. Totally. So. Check I agree with that. People. I do. Mm. Hey, is it time for a viewer question? Uh, we got a speed round coming up. Ooh, yes. even better. <laughs> hey, Scott in Hammond, Indiana writes in, as a member of a dog rescue, I usually have some foster dogs just waiting for a loving family to adopt them into their forever home. <laughs> My tech problem? Shutter lag on digital cameras. Most of the time when I need to when I need a picture of a dog, I spend time trying to get the pup into a cute pose which he or she will only be in for a fraction of a second. I click the button and the camera thinks about taking the picture a while later, by which time I usually end up with a nice side or butt shot. I'm currently using my GE 1030 camera since my Sony DSC S600 died. It's a 10 megapixel over the Sony's 6, but the shutter lag is noticeably longer. It's maddening, and this is after the research when I cut down the shutter lag because I had too big a memory card in it. I need a camera with as short of a shutter lag as possible. Am I barking up the wrong tree? Should I be doing some video capture and be taking stills from the video? I'm shying away from this because I'm not any kind of video editor at all. And as with most of your viewer questions, cost is an issue. Signed, Scott in Hammond, Indiana. Yeah, the, the video thing isn't a bad idea, and grabbing stills out of a video file isn't as painful as it sounds. You just run into the problem of actually getting good video from which to grab the still. Now, shutter lag, that sometimes ridiculously long delay between click and clunk, with, that's more of a printer term, between click and the shutter noise when it actually takes a picture, is a lot better than it used to be back in the day. But it can still be super frustrating if you're getting pictures of a toddler in motion, or like you, getting uh, puppy mill survivors to pose for the camera. There is stuff you can do to minimize it. First, shoot in the bright room. CNET.com tests shutter lags on pretty much all their digital camera reviews. I think actually all of them for bright and dark settings. And hey, bright rooms make for less shutter lags. The darker the room, the more the shutter lag, or at least there is increased shutter lag. Two, pre-focus the camera if possible, i.e. hold the button down until the focusing and exposure are set. You basically anticipate the shot. That's something sports photographers do. They want to have the kind of thing ready, and when the dude crosses the sort of place they've picked out on the field, they hammer that shutter down. Some Canon models are down to like two tenths of a second, which is to say newer cameras tend to have less shutter lags, and these are relatively inexpensive models. And SLR cameras have almost no shutter lag at all. Now, this isn't to say that like the more expensive the camera, necessarily the faster the shutter, but generally speaking, the newer the camera, go for kind of the mid-range, because the, the more expensive cameras, they tend to stuff every feature on the planet into it, like auto iris eyeball scalp focusing recognition shutter red eye release. Oh, totally. Or, uh, or the digital SLR, too. You can have it all set up, ready right. to go for that exact focal distance and anything within that frame, as long as the, the subject's gonna be there. Literally, you hit that button, there's nothing for it to really figure out beyond that right. button because you've done all the work. And that's one thing that makes shooting with an SLR pretty nice. With your standard digicams, though, there's also, most of them also feature a burst mode. Mm -hmm. So you could take like a handful of pictures at once, and hopefully one of them's going to turn out to be okay, too. You can get five butt shots instead of one with one click of the uh, shutter. And, that, and that's one of the problems, right? Is you, you kind of like, you know, if the dog's not going to sit there and be like, <laughs> then you kind of have to take a thousand pictures to get those two pictures you want. That's, that's what professional photographers do. That GE 1030 you've got, by the way, was made back by a company called General Imaging back in 2007, and it was made to be a bargain camera. I don't have any measurements for the shutter lag on it, but I suspect an upgrade will help you out quite a bit on that. Check out the reviews on CNET and look for the lowest shutter light you can find in your price range. And remember, bright room, pre-focus if possible. And you might want to have an assistant just sort of hold the dog at the camera, posable, get that nice shot. You're, this wonderful lap dog could be yours. Take 50 photos, one of them might come out right. <laughs> but you're trying to save time, and I understand that. Lighting, though, I think that was probably the number one tip for any camera. And duct tape. Duct tape. That's a joke, dog lovers. I am a dog adoptee myself. Treats. Treats. Treats work wonders. <laughs> Walk to the treat and look happy. Ryan writes in, hey guys, I wanted you to know I bought a Roku XDS recently solely on Patrick's recommendation, which leads me to my question. When will Hulu Plus be available on Roku? I did a little looking on the web, and it seems like Roku is taking a page out of Apple's book, read the release of OS 4.2 for the iPad, by saying it'll be done when it's done. 
I completely love this box and cut the cord from cable on September 1st this year and have been receiving over the air 1080 IHD content for 22 free channels in Pittsburgh for TV and an UMA for home phone. But the addition of Hulu Plus availability on my new Roku would make the switch a complete success. <laughs> love the show. Keep it up, Ryan. Hey, we were going to tell you that Roku ain't talking and neither is Hulu. But before we could, Ryan got an email from Robert Wong, <laughs> the product director of the Roku boxes, who said, quote, unfortunately, I don't have a specific time frame for when Hulu Plus will be available on Roku, mm -hmm. but we're working closely with them to get Hulu Plus up and running as soon as possible. Now, I suspect that we'll know about the same time you do, Ryan. So. Yeah, and that pretty much applies to all the impending devices that Hulu Plus is going to come out on. Including they, the TVs? They're not talking about it till it's done. <laughs> Some big money deals for that 10 bucks a month they want. Yes. Anyway, hey, Mark writes in with one of our favorite questions. Could you please let me know the best way to wipe the data stored on my PC, preferably a free method, so that I can sell it in the safe knowledge that whoever purchases it will not have access to any of my personal data. I should add that I don't have the original OS disks. I can't readily reformat and reinstall the OS. There's nothing on the PC that I need to back up and or keep. Many thanks for any help you can give me. Signed, Mark. Now, reinstalling the OS doesn't usually remove your files. Uh, Mark, it just overrides some of the data on your drive. I doubt anybody will search the remaining space on the drive for files. But if they did, they could find them. That's true, unless you did that full format. The safest thing you can do is when you're selling a PC is to take your hard drive out and melt it into a brick or grind it <laughs> or melt the surface of the platters inside. Basically, if you could physically destroy the drive, that's a yeah. good chance that nobody else is going to get that data off. That's your number one secure or shoot holes through it or whatever, you know, bury it in cement. Here's the thing, if you're not quite that paranoid and say you don't want to deal with folks who want to know why the machine doesn't have a hard drive, <laughs> go to dband.org, download a copy of Derek's Boot Nuke. It's an ISO disk and a boot disk. You burn the ISO, don't drag the file onto a, a CD or DVD, you basically burn the ISO to a CD or DVD, boot from that disk, follow the text menu and make sure you pick the right drive. Then wait a couple hours while it writes zeros and ones over your drive's contents. Voila! Barring the NSA, searching that drive with an electron microscope because you really pissed off national security, you are good to go. They couldn't get that data. You never hey, know. there is a faster way to do it too really? with newer SATA drives. They incorporate a key system basically and if you can go in with a special tool and change that key, you can do a secure erase on that drive in a matter of seconds. That's really? NASA certified now. And it's out of a Chicago group. I want to say I can find the information. I'll get that in our show notes. How about that? It's a deal. Yeah, the tool is widely available. Hey, how about the best performance from your wireless router? You'll love our next segment. But first, let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. Hey, the Ben Heck Show helps make this episode of Techzilla possible. Join Zany Electronics hobbyist Ben Heck and friends as they build and modify a host of amazing community-inspired creations. And if you've got an idea for a mod, you can share it with Ben. So tune in to The Ben Heck Show every other Monday right here on Revision 3. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you exclusively by Element 14, the online store and community for electronics design engineers. Check out element14.com. Unleash your network, people. Let's talk better streaming video brought to you by Belkin Routers. Now, we love gigabit Ethernet for streaming HD video, but cable can be a mess, yeah. if not outright impossible to string around your home. <laughs> So let's talk about our top five tips for better Wi-Fi network performance. Oh boy, location, location, location. If you don't like the, first of all, don't expect like the speed that it says inside the, the network settings on your machine. 300 megazillion bits per <laughs> second. That's just a number that the, the driver throws up there. You can do throughput testing. You can kind of compare it in different positions in your home. And a lot of time you'll find out, a lot of time you won't find a period. Closer is almost always better. No walls in between your router and what you're streaming to. If you want the best video quality, try to get your router in the same room as your set-top box, your internet-ready TV, uh, and watch the location of like 2.4 gigahertz cordless phones and microwaves, because everything runs on the open 2.4 gigahertz f spectrum frequency, right? So, right. you know, if you notice that whenever Susie pops in popcorn in the microwave and the video stream goes down, that means you need to relocate the router away from the microwave or away from the 2.4 gigahertz cell phones, because they can kind of interfere with things. And now, another tip could be to turn off modes that you're not using in terms of Wireless. Basically, if you're not using wireless B technology, turn that off. Or the same goes with G. If you're not doing that and everything in the home is using wireless N, switch the router to only use N and you'll see a nice little boost in performance. 
And it may keep all your nosy neighbors from just lobbing onto your <laughs> unsecured Wi-Fi access point. Well, but. your Wi-Fi should be secure. But <laughs> the thing is, right, is if you if you have B devices, if you have, if you have a mixed mode network like B and right. G or both G and N, the network's going to operate at the slower speed to basically make itself compatible with the older B or G network settings. So upgrade everything to G or upgrade everything to N, and you will get the best possible performance out of your wireless network. Or go with the second router and split the wireless networks on the two separate uh, totally. domains. Now I was going to say too, if you're choosing, or if during the setup of the yeah. access point, choose an empty channel. Uh, channels like 1, 6, and 11 are the ones that really don't share uh, frequencies with the adjacent channels. They basically are standalone channels that give you the best performance. If you can choose one of those three, which is really nice. Uh, some new routers actually have an auto mode, which will automatically determine if 1, 6, or 11 is the best, or some combination thereof, if mm -hmm. you're using, say, N technology. Yeah, if you use it like a Wi-Fi scanning tool, it'll tell you the, the local routers in your neighborhood that it can sense, and it'll tell you what channel they're running on. Basically, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 overlap, and 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 overlap, and there's 11. Uh, 12 and 13, we don't have 12 and 13 in the U.S., but basically try 1, 6, and 11, and one of those three might give you a wee bit of a boost or, or basically take away some of the issues with your, your devices trying to switch back and forth. Two things fighting over that same spectrum. We just kind of end up with, you, if everybody, I've seen neighborhoods where like, there were like 15 routers all trying to operate on channel 6 or channel 11, so try a different channel, see if that helps. Totally. Speaking of things that can help, WPA2 with AES encryption, that's usually your best shot at minimizing the performance hits, make sure you've got the latest drivers and, and check the compatibility on the chipsets that you're using on your, your machine. Um, I hate to say turn off encryption, but I never, for some right. older routers... <laughs> I just turn off broadcasting the SSID, yeah. and in the year, a couple of years now I've been doing that, I go through my logs. Uh, granted, somebody might have been crafty enough to get in there and do, do something, but I look through the logs and I see nobody but my own gear. Most people are too lazy. If it isn't broadcasting, most people are going to be too lazy to go try to find it if it's right. there. So got to be pretty special to do that anyway. Hey, you could also simply buy a better antenna or get a booster for the antenna that you're using as well. I've, I've, I've actually done a segment with Mr. Norton where we showed out build one yourself, and it works surprisingly well. So Yeah, we got like a 20% throughput boost with the little parabolic antennas. A little directional application to that otherwise omnidirectional antenna can help a lot if you, if you need to point that signal in a specific direction. Yeah, it's, and or actually if you can find a lar uh, more powerful antenna, basically a stronger uh, decibel rating, you know, 6 or 11 instead of 3 or 1 that will attach to your uh, video device or your router, you may increase performance. We never actually stop at 5 on our <laughs> top 5 list on HD Nation, so we're going to add a last one here. Get a better router, because here's the thing, right? When you look at performance charts that evaluate how to get the best Wi-Fi performance over long distances, the number one tool for increasing performance is stronger receiver strength at both ends, followed by stronger antenna strength at both ends distantly followed by increasing the power at either end. Amplifiers don't work so much, um, but increasing the re basically the receiver sensitivity and the antenna sensitivity can make for big improvements. Don't mix like draft N and regular N. Make sure you've got everything up to date with the latest updates. And some of that draft N hardware, or I I'd say this applies to every router. If you've owned it for any length of time, do check to see if there's an updated firmware mm -hmm. for it. Those things are little computers, and they often find bugs in the software that drive the thing. So. Uh, most of the newer routers actually provide an auto check feature where it'll check once a day or whatever to see if there's new software available for it. But if you're having issues, specifically I find with game consoles, if you're having issues in particular, uh, it's good to go see if they've done an update for that. And, you know, actually I ran into that last weekend where somebody had an older router that they had abandoned and a decent product, but they're like, oh, it doesn't work with my game console. So I went oh. and found an update that happened to specifically mention that was one of the fixes. So, ta da! Yeah. Oh, and by the way, make sure your kids aren't downloading gigantic BitTorrent files or some other peer to peer file trading service, because sometimes you find that your network performance sucks because somebody's hogging it all. Another advantage of a newer router, too, could, it could incorporate <laughs> quality of service features and basically throttling for the users on the network, too. So if you don't want any one person to be hogging all of the, all the bandwidth, that might be an option as well. Forget about VoIP. I want a max out <laughs> performance on my set-top box. Coming up next, projector recommendations for a big theater experience at home. But first, let's talk about Belkin's Play Wireless Router. One of our sponsors today, Belkin gives you the high-speed performance you need for today's networked home. How fast? Fast enough to stream HD video seamlessly to all your devices anywhere in your home. But the Play does more than just connect to your devices. It makes them better. Game systems turn into media players. Print without wires. Turn hard drives into wireless servers. With the Play's 
important app you can even finish up a download after your PC is turned off or removed. How's that for convenient? And with dual plane antennas and MIMO technology, you can get three-dimensional whole home coverage for consistent signal, even through walls and floors. Do yourself a favor, visit belkin.com slash networking slash unleash to learn more. And please support Techzilla by supporting our sponsors like Belkin. Looks like it's time for another websites we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Online Monitor Test. Now, I often talk about the importance of adjusting a television in order for it to produce the most accurate, detailed picture possible. The same holds true for computer monitors. That's why I performed my initial setup using a nifty monitor test tool from the good folks at flatpanels.dk. Or if you're in the US, you can go to flatpanelshd.com. Now, this tool is available as a downloadable executable or a Flash-based browser application. Flat Panel DK's monitor test helps you quickly and easily evaluate a display's ability to render color, text, and picture detail. I find the color range and grayscale charts especially useful for maximizing picture contrast without sacrificing detail. It's also useful for determining a display control's true function. Is that brightness setting adjusting the black level or the backlight intensity? Well, this will tell you. So after you hook up that brand new monitor, be sure to calibrate it first with the online monitor test. Hey, our friend Andrew over at Box, he sent us this question he had about selecting a front projector. He writes, hey, I'm about to make the move to New York City soon, and I picked up a sweet loft in Brooklyn. Yeah. The problem is, is that it gets tons of light, and it has 20-foot high ceilings with rather small spaces. I've currently got a 46-inch Samsung TV that I love, but it looks like a move to a projector might be in order. Was wondering if you had any, or if you had any recommendations for something that's going to let me take advantage of the boxy boxes 1080p HD with Voodoo, but won't break the bank. Basically, keep it less than a thousand dollars. Signed, Andrew, who happens to be the VP of Marketing at Boxy. It's a short list. It really is. Uh, first, best of luck on the move, yeah. and that room sounds like it's a fun space for a front projector setup. I, I love big ceilinged rooms where you have hopefully some depth too to be able to project a decent size image. I'm also jealous because he's like over by the Brooklyn Bridge and it's not too far from Junior's to get Aww. cheesecake and Brooklyn is like the pizza capital of the universe. Nice. Yeah. Hey, I gotta say though, uh, anytime we hear the words sub $1,000 and 1080p projector in the same sentence, I reflexively think of the good folks at Optima and their HD20 front projector. We showed that off on HD Nation a few mm -hmm. episodes ago. Uh, pair that with the screen and you are set. However, I do recommend that you don't go crazy with a highly ref reflective screen, aka uh, high gain screens, unless you do most of your viewing during the daytime in a brightly lit room, which you might be doing, it sounds like. Now, the gray colored screens can help minimize the effect of uncontrollable ambient light, be it sunlight or reflections off of a light colored wall or the ceiling. Nothing short of a commercial grade front projector will be able to overcome a brightly lit room with lots of ambient light reflecting off the screen. That's just, you need some serious hardware to overcome that in, an, in, a, in a traditional setting. Now, using the Samsung flat panel, I'm assuming it's a flat panel, during the day and switching over to the big screen after sunset, sounds like it's gonna be your ideal solution. And for about $920, I think I saw it for online, that HD20, it, that actually puts out a pretty good amount of light for a projector in that price category. I believe it's about 1,700 lumens, which isn't bad. Uh, again, though, the more reflective the screen surface is, the less, uh, the more it affects your viewing angles. Basically, you, you end up, you can end up with a hot spot right in the middle of the picture if the screen's too reflective, and uh, basically, it's it's basically just bringing all that light and concentrating it in the center of the picture where you don't want it as it's being reflected back to you. Now, the reason I was had my head buried in my notebook here for a second is one of the things we've been talking about with the Optoma, there's like one downside to the Optoma is that it doesn't have the best black levels. Yeah, if you're sitting in a, if you're sitting in a pitch black room, you'll notice that black is a little gray, so inky dark. Yeah, so you can play around with a gray screen to try to help boost the black levels a little bit, but it's kind of funny because the next really big step for a 1080p projector would be there's something like Epson's 8500UB you mentioned or Panasonic's AE4000. Uh, I love the AE4000 because then you get into three chip projectors which have some advantages over single chip designs like an inexpensive, most of your DLP front projectors that you see out there including your rear projection DLP TVs are all using a single chip and then spinning a color wheel or some kind of color right. system in front of that whereas with three chip systems, you process the red, the blue, and the green light independently, which gives you better brightness output for a given lamp system. 
the downside is that either one of those projectors are going to cost you almost twice as much, yeah. around $2,000 before taxes and delivery, which actually is kind of a bargain compared to one of our favorite projectors of all time, which came from Digital Projection. They loaned us an absolutely gorgeous $17,000 LED-based projector, which I highly recommend if you have the cash for the ultimate home theater projector experience. You need a good room for that. You need yes. dark walls. Light control is number one. <laughs> that would not be a good projector for a giant window lofted room, Andrew. So, hey, hope this helps everybody out who's been thinking about projectors. And remember, the screen is crucial, or at least having a nice white or gray wall. Most definitely. After the break, more viewer questions, including one near to our hearts, audio compression options. But first, let's thank one of our sponsors. Go to Assist Express. If you're an IT or a software consultant, you're always looking for ways to be competitive. You need to grow your business, but you can't be in two places at once. That's why I recommend remote support with the new GoToAssist Express. The faster you can connect to a customer, the faster you can move on to the next challenge. With GoToAssist Express, you will increase revenue by handling more support requests, reduce travel time and overhead costs, support clients even when they're not at their computer, rise above the competition by providing faster, more professional service. Techzilla viewers can try GoToAssist Express free for 30 days. For this special offer, visit gotoassist.com slash techzilla. That's gotoassist.com slash techzilla for a free trial. Dave says we've got a bunch of computers around the house and they all seem to have one or more external USB or Firewire hard drives attached. And there are all kinds of shares set up between them. All in all, it's a logical and aesthetic mess. To clean this up, I'd like to have a single server I can just stick in the basement. What I'm looking for needs to be reliable, redundant, probably some kind of RAID, easily expandable, pop out a disk, pop in a bigger one, flexible so I don't have to go buy unteen identical disks, support multiple client platforms, including OS X, Linux, and Windows, have really good Mac support for Time Machine, he says, Drobo has a good advertising budget, but I've just heard too many horror stories there. So, that's a simple list, right? What's your recommendation to either build or buy Dave in Delaware? Um, I gotta say, honestly, Veronica and I have both had extensive experience with the Drobo, and I think, personally, you know, I, I personally think Drobo has been slagged a lot uh, online. Possibly because people who've had data failures went absolutely berserk, as well they should, because the whole point of the Drobo is to protect your data. But then again, I've had friends who have had NAS boxes fail from several other companies, and of course, you know, every so often there's a gigantic fail with the DIY options out there. It, you need a NAS device. Yeah. Just put it to you simple like that. Something absolutely. you can connect to your local network, and then regardless of who you buy this from or build yourself, it's going to allow all of your computers, regardless of what operating system, as long as they can connect to your network, mm -hmm. they should be able to see your local storage and then be able to do either local backups or just finally consolidate all that data you have on the different drives into one secure storage that includes like some form of RAID, preferably some form that also allows you to do hot swaps where you can either right. upgrade the drives one at a time or if a drive fails, you just pop it out and put in another one. You're set. Um, you, I'm, honestly, I, I gotta say, his list of needs, though, he, you are a poster child for just getting a Drobo and being right. done with it, but... Or a Windows Home server. Or a Windows Home server from HP makes them, right off the bat. And yeah. every network company out there, major network company, makes routers or whatever, they all make a good NAS product, it seems, nowadays. The companies like Linksys and Netgear, they both have some product out there to try, so... One of the things we're playing around with, we've talked about it, I've been playing around with some drive configurations and settings, uh, especially with like ZFS inside of a free NAS configuration, which is a roll your own DIY NAS. Another option out there that people either love or hate is Unraid. We're gonna try to build both of those and sort of compare those to some of the, to the other options out there. But yeah, Drobo, Windows Home Server, um, free NAS and Unraid are roll your own options. There's another one who I just kind of met these guys through Twitter, so I'm oh, gonna cool. try to build one of their boxes. Um, there are a lot of options out there. We're going to do some as much testing as we can and do a NAS roundup, and we'll see what we find out from that. Because regardless of where you have your failure, right. if the hardware fails, no matter what it is, whether it's a system you built yourself or, say, with a product like a Drobo, you're going to have to replace that hardware. You might be able to still save the drives and move them over, but. Those are all the things you got to keep in mind. There's always going to be a point of failure somewhere. So, And if your house burns down, it takes out your NAS box, no matter what brand it is. So it's also a good idea to take advantage of something like Carbonite or Mosey or, or Amazon's S3, some sort of off-site backup. Or There's a pricing war with those services yeah. right now. They're basically allowing you to upload everything you want for free, but then they charge you to get it back if you need it. But Which is better than losing it forever if you have yeah. serious data collection. Especially if it's a static collection, photos. maybe the, the yearly archive of the best photos you've ever <laughs> taken in the world. And, that kind of thing. But the one thing you mentioned too, if you're going to build your own, it, we, we were debating if you wanted to go with a hardware RAID card 
to drive all the drives or a software setup. And we're thinking along the lines of more go with software because <laughs> what if the company that made the RAID card goes out of business or, or you don't get the exact same RAID card and there's some firmware difference that causes whatever drives you connect to suddenly be yeah. incompatible. There's, there's a whole mess of issues to deal with there. And it just depends how much legwork you want to do on the back end to make it all work and to maintain it for hopefully forever. And <laughs> nothing's going to last it's forever. It's a long, so. long time. I'll, but I'll replace the Drobo with a Super Drobo. Or, <sighs> it's always a good idea, no matter what NAS box or, or DIY role your own NAS you use, to make sure you have a backup of your most critical data, preferably it's somewhere else, like not in your neighborhood, but somewhere else in the country, preferably out in the cloud. Yeah. Ed sends us this email asking, where can I purchase a notebook without any OS pre-installed so I can then install Ubuntu? Optionally, are there any trustworthy companies out there that sell notebooks with Ubuntu preloaded? I am not looking to pay extra for any warranty and or technical support on this box, especially since I will eventually install a newer Ubuntu OS uh, after backing up, of course, thereby nullifying the existing warranty. Signed, Ed, from Point Pleasant Beach, New Jersey. I should point out that, that installing an operating system isn't going to nullify your warranty because the warranty, more often than not, is, is on your hardware. They don't particularly care what operating your system you're running. They, they, they care about basically the hardware is what costs them. Did you money. pour Coke in the keyboard or did the system right. really just fail randomly? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think somebody's gonna deny you a warranty claim because you were running Ubuntu versus Windows versus whatever on your no. notebook. And even yeah. nowadays, there's usually a backup partition on the same hard drive. Even if you wiped that out, they usually give you the option, most of the major manufacturers will give you the option of downloading those image disks from a website <laughs> if you wish to go down that route. But Dell did offer Ubuntu on notebook do. PCs. Oh, they still do. Okay, yeah. good to know. Okay, so Dell is still doing it. Uh, it's preloaded, so you wouldn't install them yourself. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny because one of the reasons it's so hard to find a notebook with no operating system is because one of the, the one of the sort of like legendary negotiating things is like Microsoft doesn't want notebooks to go out without operating system because Microsoft thinks that you're stealing an operating system if you're not buying an operating system preloaded with Microsoft. Eh, that, Sounds ridiculous, that, that whole money but, thing. but it's it's kind of like the deal they made with some of the big vendors out there. Um, none of the volume vendors, PC makers, uh, sell machines without an OS, probably as part of their deal to be able to install Microsoft Windows so incredibly cheaply. That's the key right there. It's just helping drive the cost down with whatever operating right. system. But Ubuntu is free. <laughs> anyway, the truth of the matter is that you can simply wipe out any pre-install with a Linux install after you get it out of the box. I mean, you're going to need to do it anyway to ensure that you have the latest distro available and you have Windows license if you never need to use it. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to take the moral high ground or just trying to save some money by not paying for Windows, it's going to be almost impossible to do from a major vendor. See so if you can find a local vendor, a, a local VAR, who will sell you sort of a major brand like Ace or Asus type notebook uh, without an operating system. It's tougher on a notebook. I guess if you could pick yeah. up a used notebook, oh, there's, there's some risk there, but <laughs> then you're at least not paying directly to the man for the operating system big. Yeah. You're not crazy. It's tough to find a notebook without Windows pre-installed. I'm surprised. But you can do you can get Ubuntu notebooks from Dell. Good to know. Hey, finally, we have a question from Albert. I just watched the Rip Monster 3000 episode of Techzilla. I want to know what quality I should rip my music on a hard drive. I usually use 128K MP3 format, but I want better sounding files. I'm using Windows Media Center and the Zune software to listen to music. Signed, Albert in Fargo, North Dakota. I think lossless is the main answer we're going to give you. Yeah. Uh, if you can stick with a lossless format that's mathematically identical to the original audio track on the CD, no degradation in quality, that's going to give you the absolute best. It's going to sound just like yeah. the CD. I mean, hydrogenaudio.org, which is a super hardcore audiophile music, and they do a lot of music encoding. Um, they did these sort of A-B tests, and there's kind of an overlap on this between you know Apple lossless, FLAC, Whatever the Og Vorbis, uh, you know. Lossless should all sound the same. Yeah. It's just a matter of what extra little bit of compression you can get out of those right. formats over, say, a raw WAV file. But I got to say, in my impromptu listening tests, I, I basically going through my collection of CDs and trying out different compressed formats, I found Og to be pretty superior over, say, MP3 or even AAC encoding that I was trying. Mm -hmm. But 
I doubt it plays natively on the Zune or in Windows no. Media. So that's kind of out the door. Uh, well, you can go WMA lossless. I don't know if the newer, I, I know in the older Zunes, WMA lossless would be downgraded to 320K uh, WMA, which is not bad. The Windows Media file is pretty good. Um, ideally, I prefer FLAC. Most of my collection, though, is in Apple lossless because that works with my wife's iPod and, and our iPhones and stuff. I use DB Power Amp and their music converter software. I basically do, I, I encoded all of my audio CDs to FLAC, a lossless format and then using DB Power Amp, I can convert that to any other format I want, be it lo another lossless format, like Apple lossless for portable devices that are Apple-based, or, or compressed formats, more lossy formats like MP3 or right. AUG or others. So it's nice to have that, that native library of raw audio sitting there, so I can always go back later and change it up. And I would highly recommend using uh, a DB Power Amp over you know, Windows Media or iTunes to rip your files because you want a, the best quality rip, and I'm, I'm kind of in love with DB Power Amp doing secure ripping. There's some free tools that'll get you there as well. Exact audio you, copy. And Hydrogen Audio is a great place to look up all that stuff, right. but it's, DB Power Amp is one nice integrated tool that has all the functionality right there, and it, it, it does make it fairly easy to do. Hence, it's the, the powerful tool at the core of the Rip Monster 3000. Yeah. Hey, for everybody watching, we love on your questions, so Email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech Hill product reviews, how to you ask us, we'll do it, but we need your emails to drive the show, so don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Hey, even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have with <laughs> and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on the show. Why are you laughing? I thought it was a beautiful thing. It made me happy inside. Uh, hey, just one thing, keep the 15 seconds or less, upload to the YouTube, the YouTube, and send us the link in an email with, quote, video questions in the subject line. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash techzilla. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. More. I need more young, vibrant women. That's why I'm here. That's why I come to San Francisco once in a while. Dave messages us and messages us, is us in yeah. three. Dave says, I've got a bunch of computer in three. It looks like it's time for another quote. A quote. <laughs> yeah. Suck it. It's also useful for determining a display's control. Uh, uh, Suck it. Unfortunately, we couldn't get a box in house in. Oh, sorry. I will pay attention to the tally lights. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> blah, blah, blah.